so we now welcome also our uh, congregation uh, watching this from home. Today is Septuagesima, which is the first uh, Sunday in the season that goes by different names, pre-Lent, the Jessima season. Septuagesima simply means 70. We're roughly 70 days now from uh, Easter, uh, and uh, we begin our journey, if you like, towards Lent. And over the next three Sundays, beginning with today, we will be learning about uh, some of the central themes of the Christian faith, beginning today with the, uh, the, the most fundamental central theme of the Christian faith, which is that all that we have from God is by grace, but as his gift. And our readings and our hymns all uh, reflect that. And so we begin now our service um, with our opening hymn, By Grace I'm Saved, Grace Free and Boundless.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The fundamental warning that we hear today in our psalm, which is Psalm 95, we'll read that after the Old Testament reading, and in our second reading from the St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, is that we must be watchful, that we must not disregard God's word, not get lost on the way, but stay on the path of salvation until the very end. And the art of staying on that path of salvation is very, very straightforward, at least easy to describe. It's a matter of keeping your eyes fixed in the right place. And there are two things that we must keep before our eyes all the time. One of them, the first one, is our need of salvation. And our need of salvation arises from the simple fact of our sin. Sin which is the cause of all our suffering and all the suffering in the world. Sin which is the root cause of death itself. And the moment that we forget to contemplate our sin, things will go wrong. We become careless in our lives. We begin to follow the desires of our own hearts rather than the will of God. And whenever we do that, we set ourselves in opposition to God. And the end of that road is God's wrath, his judgment, his condemnation. And therefore, we must always remember our sin, to fight against it, and to confess it. Seek the righteousness of God's will. But that on its own is not enough. Because if we truly contemplate our sin, and nothing but our sin, we will be crushed by the weight of it. Because you will notice, if you haven't already, that we cannot get rid of it. We can become aware of it, we can resist it, but we cannot remove it from ourselves. And when we do overcome a sin, all we do generally, usually, is we exchange one for another like someone jumping from a frying pan and landing in the fire. And therefore, just as we need to remember our sin, we must remember our Saviour. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who Scripture says is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Our faith comes from him and he is the one who keeps it going and helps it to grow and to, and to hold ever more tightly to God's promises. When we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, we have our eyes fixed on the solution. We cannot overcome our sin. He has already overcome it. We cannot keep ourselves alive. He has already defeated death. We cannot become righteous. He has already given to us his righteousness as a gift. We are gathered here today because God in his mercy and his love has called us here to receive the gifts of salvation. And because he's gracious and merciful, he is honest and truthful. And so he's point, he points out to you your sin. He points out to you that you do not love God with your whole heart. You do not love your neighbor as yourself. That you deserve to die for your sin. But that Jesus already died. So that you might take hold of the promise and the sure hope of the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. And thereby be kept from going astray, that you continue your war following Jesus until the end, when we are received into glory by him who loved us and gave himself for us. And therefore, beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And he forgave the iniquity of my sins. O 
Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I called upon the Lord. From his temple he heard my voice. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. For the sake of humble people, but the Lord divides me bring down. You have equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The cause of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress I call upon the Lord, from his temple he heard my voice. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. And on earth, peace, good and well to all men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father of all mighty, O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, thou it takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sin of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For thou only art holy, thou only art the Lord, thou only the Christ with the Holy Ghost. Our most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. O Lord, graciously hear the prayers of your people that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading for Septuagesima is from Exodus chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted therefore water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, 
Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 95. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with service of praise. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. He is known by the depths of the earth, the height of the mountains by his wisdom. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us worship the bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you make his model, we will abide in your heart as a very heart, as will today be one of the children of the Lord. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof that they had seen my work, for forty years I know that generation, and said, There are people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. The epistle reading is from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, the ninth and tenth chapters, beginning to read in chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. This is the word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied, replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first, last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to God. Let us confess together the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our hymn of the day, number 555 in the Lutheran service book, Salvation Unto Us Has Come. This hymn was written in the very first hymn book of the Reformation. Uh, for the first hymnal of the Reformation, published in 1524. Um, and it was written at a time when most people knew very little about the Christian faith, uh, because they hadn't been taught very well. So it sets out the Christian faith in very simple terms for us all to understand. And late, many, much later, uh, many opponents of the Re Reformation complained that it was hymns like these that uh, w that, in their words, led people to hell, because they learned the gospel from the, from the hymns, and that's why they remained Protestant, which was apparently a very bad thing. But we continue to sing them with pride. 
grace to you, peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Holy Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. It's not fair. Have you ever said that? It's not fair. The world, well, let me tell you first thing, the world is not fair. So if you expect it to be fair, stop. It never is, it never will be. The world is not fair, and nor should we expect it to be, and the sooner that we get used to that idea, the less disappointed we will be. But that is not our sermon today. You should expect God to be fair, wouldn't you? The world is not fair because people are selfish, because things don't work as they should, and people, generally speaking, like to take advantage of other people when they can, and if there's not enough to go around, the quickest and the strongest win, and the weaker and the slower lose, and that's just how it is. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, etc., etc. But you would think that God at least is fair. That God gives us fairly and not unfairly. Now this parable of Jesus tells a really, really unfair story. We've got people who work in a vineyard. Some people work for 12 hours. Some people work for 9 hours. Some people work for 6 hours. Some people work for 3 hours. And some people work for 1 hour. So some of the people work 12 times longer than some of the other people. And not only do they work 12 times longer, but by the time the last people come in, all the hard work's been done. It's no longer hot, it's nice and cool, and all you need to do really is clear up all, your, all the mess and you're done. It's like you turn up at work, by the time people are just wiping the surfaces down and turning off the machines and say, well, let me help you. And they all get paid the same. Really unfair. It's like you go to school, and somebody writes a brilliant essay of 20 pages, spends a whole weekend doing it, and somebody else just writes a little scrap of notes saying, sorry, sir, I forgot to do so. Here's, I think it's like this, and hands it in, and they all get an A. It's not fair. And Jesus doesn't say, look at how unfair this vineyard owner is. At least God is fair. No, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He is basically saying, God is not fair. I mean, if you knew that this is the deal, which of you would turn up at 6 in the morning for the 12-hour shift, and which of you would sneak in at 5 p.m. for the one-hour shift, given that you all get paid a denarius? I know what, what I would do when the alarm clock went off. How can it be how can God be so unfair? Well, just in case you lose the thread at some point between now and the end of the sermon, the point is, thanks be to God that he's not fair. Okay, But let's work our way to that point. So we have this vineyard, and somebody who owns a vineyard, and he hires people to come and work in there. And he offers them the going rate for a worker, which is a denarius. If you earn a denarius a day, it was basically what is nowadays called the living wage. It's enough to survive on, but not much more. You never get rich, but you won't starve. And so if you got offered a denarius a day, you'd take it because that's what you'd expect to get. Nobody would pay you more. And so it seems like a really good deal. They got work, and now they're going to get paid what they need to be paid so that they can go home in the evening and they have enough to feed themselves and their family, pay their bills and all is well and hopefully tomorrow they'll get another day's work and they'll be all right tomorrow as well. Now the thing about this vineyard owner is that he, can, he keeps going back every three hours. The first lot he gets there at six in the morning, he goes back at nine in the morning, midday, three in the afternoon and five in the afternoon to look if there are any more workers. Now, we don't know why, but the thing is that every time he gets there, there is somebody there waiting to be hired. And every time he finds people waiting to be hired, he hires them. 
He gives them also the rest of the day's worth of work. Now, we're not told, he doesn't promise them what he's going to pay. He just says, whatever is just, I will pay you. Now, what do you think would be a just payment for somebody who gets hired three hours later than their first office? What would be a just payment? Or, if we'd retranslate the word, whatever is righteous, I will pay you. What would be a righteous payment for nine hours' work rather than twelve? Or when you go to midday, six hours' work, half the work, rather than full day's work? Or the people who work just a quarter of the day? And for some bizarre, inexplicable reason, he still goes there at five o'clock when the work's basically done, and he still finds people there waiting to be hired. He, what kind of a fool hangs around for 11 hours, or comes in 11 hours late hoping for some work? And even if you did get work and you got paid one twelfth of a denarius, I mean, it's a bit like if you're, you know, if, let's say, if you're being promised 10 pounds an hour, and you work for 12 hours, you get 120 pounds. Well, in the end, whether you earn 10 pounds or no pounds, if you need 120 pounds to live, it makes very little difference. You can buy one twelfth of a food that you need not to be hungry, and your children to be hungry. What kind of a desperate fool would do that? Whatever is righteous, I will pay you, he says. If God was working fairly, if this vineyard owner was being fair, he would pay them each in proportion to what they have done. But he doesn't. But the unfairness isn't that he pays too little. That's the thing. He's not stingy. What's unfair is that he overpays people. And the people who work the longest get really cross. Because they feel that if we if got a denarius for an hour's work, we should have bargained for a lot more. If he's going to pay them a, a whole day's worth, well, we should get a lot more because we worked harder. That would be fair, wouldn't it? But it wouldn't be righteous. It would be fair. He would give them each exactly what they deserve. You could even say it was just, but it wouldn't be righteous. What do I need? What's the difference between being just and being righteous? On this question, church history turns. On this question, the whole of the Christian faith rests. Is God a just God? Or is he more than just just? Is he, in fact, righteous? If God is just, he will give to everyone exactly what's coming their way, what they deserve. Good people get rewarded, bad people get punished. And those who, have, who are a mixed bag, well, they get patted on the back for the good things, and then they get penalized for their bad things, and we'll see how it all works out. That's justice. That's how the law courts work. And in fact, in some religions of the world, it even has a name that's become very fashionable in the West for reasons that I fail to understand. It's called karma. What goes round comes round. Good people get rewarded, and bad people, well, they get punished. You leave a good life and you could come back as a cow, or bad life, you come back as a frog. Karma. And it is a most terrifying thought. The idea that the universe works on karma. Because when you start examining your life with a fine-tooth comb, which is what karma does, and what God does also in his justice, we all begin to get terribly worried. We discover that whether we've been Christians all our life, from as long as we remember, and we've always been laboring in God's vineyard. Our work has not been up to scratch. You know, there's a, if you've ever worked at McDonald's, they have one of their, their sort of uh, managerial sayings that if there's time to lean, there's time to clean. 
that if you've got time to hang around, you also therefore have time to do, be doing something else. Well, all of us in our Christian lives have spent a lot of time leaning rather than cleaning, resting rather than working, idling rather than pursuing the righteousness of God and his good will. And not only that, but we find when we start examining our hearts even a little bit more closely, that it's not just that we haven't done quite enough, but so much of our lives is stained by outright disobedience. We have not been just not been working in the vineyard, we've been breaking the tools, cutting down that th- those things that ought to be grown. We've been doing damage to ourselves, to others, and to the honor and glory of God. Do you still want God to be fair and just? Do you still want him to give to everyone what they deserve? Because if so, we might, might as well pack up, switch off the lights and go home and wait for the terrible outcome of God's justice. But God is more than just. As I said, he is righteous. And the righteousness of God means not only that he acts in truth, but most of all it means, and most importantly, it means that he acts according to his own character and according to his own promises. This vineyard owner doesn't pay people according to what they have deserved for their work, He pays them according to what they need in order to live. He fulfills their need, even though the payment that he gives them is completely and ridiculously unfair. It's way too kind, far too generous. If you turn up at five o'clock, you deserve less than a twelfth. You deserve a portion of a 12 because the hard work's done. But if you get a 12 or less than a 12 or even a half of a denarius, you will starve. You cannot live. Your children will starve. Your wife will starve. And you will be out on the street begging. And the moment that happens, then you are, you become unemployable. Because the moment you begin to beg, you lose your honor and your reputation. And now nobody will hire you. And so it goes on. Downhill all the way to the grave. And he knew it. And so he gives to them what they need even though they have not deserved it. And Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this. What do you deserve from God? Put all your good deeds, your holy thoughts, your pure and sincere prayers into one basket. And then put in the other basket all the times when you've been indifferent to God. And his will. Every time that you've acted in selfishness. Every time that you have actually done what you know you shouldn't do, but you do it anyway. And leave those things undone that you know you ought to have done. Put them in the other basket. Which of those baskets will be easier to lift? And yours look just like mine. One is half empty at best. And the other one is overflowing and keeps filling up more and more. But thanks be to God, he is not fair. He doesn't give to me or to you what we deserve. He gives us what we need. What do we need? We need to be holy. We need to be sinless. We need to be pure. We need to be righteous as he is righteous. And so he gives those to us. He gave his son to win for us righteousness. To live a holy life. To keep God's law perfectly. To pay for the full price of all our sins. To bear the punishment and the anger and the wrath and the condemnation of God in totality. The whole full day's labor from birth to death. Without leaning, without taking breaks, without breaking machinery on the way. And now he comes to us and he says, all of that, 
has already been done. You've turned up very late in the day. Everything's already been done. Everything's already finished. There's nothing left to do. But still you're hungry. Still you're thirsty. Still you're dying. Still you are laboring under sin and God's judgment. Here, have what you need. Have the holiness of Jesus. Have the righteousness of Jesus. Have the good works of Jesus. And present those to God. Completely unfair. Somebody else had to work for you. But that somebody was Jesus and he does it gladly. The first shall become last. And who is first? But he who is the firstborn of all. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not created, not even in the distant part like Adam and Eve, but begotten of the Father before all worlds. That's how first he made himself last, so that we who are straggling behind, who are last, who deserve to be beggars, who deserve to die, he has made us first. He has given to us everything that is his. Not only has given to us, but continues to do so. The Christian faith is not a matter of being brought to the start line by Jesus and now you run. But the Christian faith and our hope is this. That Jesus doesn't give us a chance to run better. But he has picked us up and he carries us. That where he has gone and where he now is, he takes us. And therefore our striving and our that race of which St. Paul writes, which we must finish, is not our effort to get there before it's too late, but rather to stay with him who has already won for us, to continually follow Jesus. This parable was told in response to a man who wanted to know how to get into the kingdom of heaven by doing all the right things. A rich young man. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, do. You want to do? You get to inherit eternal life by doing. Do the commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I do that already. What else? Give your wealth to the poor and follow me. And he went away sad. Because it turns out that he did not yet know God. He had a different God. His love of money. And the answer to that, Jesus, in the end, is not from Jesus, is not try harder. Don't be as bad at keeping the law as that young man. You must do even better than that. But the answer is our parable today. It's not our doing that saves us. We don't inherit the kingdom of heaven by being even more excellent than him. But rather, that we receive it as a gift on the strength of him who loved us and gave himself for us. Final thought. Therefore, we must not begrudge those who sneak in at the last minute. Every year when this lesson comes up, and every time it comes in Bible study, someone says, that seems really unfair, that you can just kind of live a sinful life and then have a deathbed conversion at the last minute and get in. Isn't that the point? Not only that, if God's grace is free for all, it is really free for all. If we don't deserve it, then we don't deserve it. And it doesn't matter whether you've been a Christian two minutes before your death or two centuries, it's the same deal. But not only that, but to live in the kingdom of God is not some terrible suffering. And if only you could just live in sin as long as, you like, as, long as possible and then sneak in at the last minute. As if that was the suffering. Now to believe in the kingdom of God is a privilege. To stand around in the marketplace for 11 hours hoping for some work is not some great stroke of luck. Because your life depends on that work. And in the same way, when we are rescued from a life of sin, we don't get drawn from happiness into righteous misery. But rather we are drawn from what we think is happiness into true joy which is the righteousness and peace that comes from the Holy Spirit. 
Some of you have known this all your life. Some of you have only just discovered it. It doesn't matter. Christ died for all. He offers his gifts to all. His promises are for all. And that we are here today, receiving them, goes to show just how gracious, merciful, and patient our Heavenly Father is. That he has waited until 2021, the end of January 2021, to deliver these gifts to us even now, at this last minute, towards the end of time. May God grant you joy and peace in following Jesus Christ. And may he keep you steadfast, holding on to the promises that he has made, to his righteousness and the gifts of his love. And bring us all to the everlasting joy of his kingdom. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand for the offertory. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Trusting in God's love and mercy towards all, let us now pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Holy Trinity Lutheran Church, for the congregations, uh, office holders, boards and committees of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of England, especially the Nominations Committee, for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Kenya, and the Evangelical Lutheran Conference and Ministerium of Kenya, Somali Lutheran Church, Hill Park Baptist Church here in Fairham, and for the Holy Christian Church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Let us pray to the Lord. For Pastor Ephion, Pastor Gurhan, and for all who have been called to proclaim Christ's saving name, that they would remain faithful in their callings. Let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, its mission and its people, for the Brighton and Oxford missions, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and the renewal of life, and have a foretaste of the feast to come, let us pray to the Lord. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father. Let us pray to the Lord. For Elizabeth, our Queen, for her government, for the Parliament, and for all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their callings, and especially for those who work in our armed forces and in our emergency services, in the health care and social care uh, systems of our country. 
that God would protect them from all harm. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides, to support the church and to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick in body or in mind, the elderly and the disabled, all oppressed and persecuted peoples, and especially Ron, Cindy and Nicola, Jean, Reg and Carol, John, Helen and Holly, Mike, Ian, Doug and Myra, Howard, Jana, Sheridan, Holly, Rita, Diana, Desiree, Philip and Carol, Ilsa, Claire and Phil, Johan, Charlotte, John and his family, Tim, Pauline, Sharon, Joby, Christine, Serena, Jenny, Michael, Freddie and Grace, John, Philip, Matt, Martin, Ken, Tressy, Val, Emily, Lena, Roger and Emily, Wendy, Ingrid, Anya and Neil, Sine, the Uyghur people, the Yazidi people, Christians who suffer persecution throughout the world, including Amir and Asana and their children. That God would grant them relief in their sufferings and hope in his promises. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who mourn, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give him heartfelt thanks. Let us pray to the Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own High Priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us, for to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. And with my spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, meet, uh, meet right and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world, grant us thy peace. Amen. Jesus has come for everything is prepared. Thank you.
Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared for the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we employ that of your mercy. You strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Let us bless the Lord. Be the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Remain standing for our closing hymn, O Holy Spirit, grant us grace. <laughs>